So perfect. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. And you know, very cool to be at GIST and never thought I would have this opportunity. So very exciting. So today I'll be talking to you about some of my PhD, more earlier in my PhD work, looking at machine learning and how that interfaces with chemical transport models and maybe to link with Earth system models in the future. And so Really, our scientific advancements in atmospheric chemistry modeling and climate modeling is really outpacing our ability to use these models and sort of um, use the scientific understandings that we're getting from, you know, observations and experiments. So this is a complicated kind of looking figure, but I'm showing you here over the last 40 years or so, uh, all these different climate models uh, dictated by the IPCC uh, assessment reports, the AR123, et cetera. The filled circles are the atmospheric global uh, circulation models, and then those coupled to the ocean models, and also more complicated Earth system models. On the y-axis on the left is these model resolutions of these models going from very coarse to very high resolution. And on this one-to-one -one line and the right axis is this uh, Moore's law. So it states the sort of the number of flops or the ability of our computers to make rapid calculations is increasing over time. Um, it's, the law states that every two or so years, there's a roughly doubling of computational ability, that um, we're putting more processors on microchips and we can do faster and faster computations. And so the idea then would be, oh, then horizontal resolution and high resolution of our model should scale with that. But we're not really seeing that. We're seeing things start to level off. And this is because we're not just trying to increase the resolution of our models, we're also jam-packing it with complexity. You know, we want more chemical species in our mechanisms, we want better parameterizations in our climate models, and that's really slowing things down and limiting us for these high-resolution grids that we desire. And sort of foremost among these challenges is modeling atmospheric chemistry. So the National Research Council uh, in 2010 dictated that including comprehensive atmospheric chemistry into Earth system models is a priority research science area. But really, we're still pretty far from that. Um, here I'm showing you uh, results from Seb Eastham's GeoSchem high performance paper, where on the x-axis is the number of computer cores we give to a simulation, so the computer resources we devote. And on the Y, it's the time it takes for each of those pieces of the model to run. And you see that chemistry in purple here dominates the cost of that simulation. Nearly half of the time it takes for a chemical transport model to run is just spent solving the species and the chemical mechanism. And there are two main reasons for that. One is chemistry is very high dimensional. In GeoSchem, we have 250 plus species. They're you know, very stiff, meaning that um, the lifetimes range from uh, less than a second for radical species to much longer than a time step. So we have, you know, CO2 can last hundreds of years, CO months, et cetera. Um, compared to climate models where the number of track variables is much lower in dimensionality. Um, oh, I should say that um, both the reasons of high dimensionality and stiff relationships is the big problem here. And really right now that the bottom line is incorporating this comprehensive atmospheric chemistry with hundreds of species that we care about is just not feasible. You know, these Earth system models take days to weeks to months to run. Incorporating that atmospheric chemistry into them um, slows that down to multiple months, basically. So very slow. And I'm not going to belabor the point too much in terms of the background of chemical solvers, but just kind of giving you a reason for why it's so expensive. So because chemical systems are very stiff, meaning that we care about how radicals react with much longer term lived species, that we need solvers to uh, solve for these relationships. And the easiest, kind of quickest kind of solver we have are these explicit solvers, where the if the lifetime of your chemical species are very similar, such as aer if you have an aerosol only mechanism, which aerosols last around a week in the atmosphere, that your time step for your solver can be around the lifetime of the chemical you're interested in. So that would work. However, if you want to solve even a very simple mechanism, such as methane, you know, can last 10 years in the atmosphere, and OH, less than a second, you need a very small time step for the evolution of this really long species. So if you don't have this time step that is similar to your very small time step, you kind of have very explosive, negative kind of um, behavior from your solver. 
So in order to counteract that, we have this uh, reformulation of solving differential equations called an implicit solver, where you can always have stable and positive solutions, but your time step has to be, uh, or you, excuse me, you have to reconfigure the differential equations to solve for, and it's kind of also costly because it's a very iterative uh, algorithm. And this is even uh, more so true with GeoSchem and kind of complicated chemical transport and climate models that have chemistry, we need higher order implicit solvers. So higher order means we need more sort of accuracy in the solutions to these differential equations. And in order to do that, we need to construct and invert a Jacobian matrix. Jacobian matrix can be thought of as a stiffness matrix or a similarity matrix, mapping sort of the relationship of each species to all the other species. And then you have to invert this big matrix. So this can be very time expensive. So it allows the time step to be bigger than less than a second, because that would just take forever, but you still have to iteratively solve each time step multiple times to get the correct chemistry. And that's sort of demonstrated in this paper, where um, along the terminator between night and day, we have a, you know, almost a thousand plus internal time steps that are happening just over a single time step. So you can kind of see why this is sort of getting bogged down. These solvers are very expensive because we require a very high degree of accuracy. And so there's ways to kind of simplify mechanisms that's been done you know, since uh, we started modeling things with computers. We can lump similar species together, lumping NO and NO2 or a NOx family, for example. Uh, we can simplify the mechanism or neglect minor species so we can start taking out species of a mechanism to speed it up. But really, this only gets us at most a times two speed up. If we're going to have this comprehensive atmospheric chemistry in these Earth system models, really complicated, big models, we really need orders of magnitude gain for this to happen to incorporate this more sophisticated chemistry. And early on in my PhD, we thought that machine learning or potentially, you know, or specifically neural networks might be a solution to this problem for three main reasons. One, they're considered non-parametric universal function approximators, meaning that they can map any input to any output, regardless of the complexity or non-linearities between the input outputs. And if anyone's very you know, familiar with ozone chemistry, we know that this kind of things, uh, relationships can be very non-linear. Two, learn to predict based on uh, large patterns uh, that are uh, repeated within a big data set. Anyone's ever run CESM, the GIS model, we know we can generate a ton of data really easily with these models. And three, and probably most importantly, it's proven to speed up solving differential equations at orders of magnitude gain. This is because we're essentially replacing that expensive ODE solver that I just talked to you about with a series of learned matrix representations that maps input to output of these uh, chemical species. And so before starting grad school, I worked a couple years at the University of Washington as a junior research scientist, and I started working on this kind of problem where I took a very simple zero-dimensional box model, generated a ton of data, archived it, and tried to train a machine learning chemical solver that just maps the input to the output of species. So T to T plus one, what happens over one time step. I trained the model, got some kind of good result, but then I ran the model forward in time uh, where the output is the input into the next time step, just kind of your classic integrating model forward in time. And we see by the end of a day, we have this explosive error growth in here is a, for example, ozone. Similarly, Christoph Keller and Matt Evans did a very similar project at, um, while at Harvard uh, using the GeoSchem uh, chemical transport model using a random forest instead of a neural network but still saw this runaway error growth over the course of one month. So we have two different chemical mechanisms, two different machine learning kind of algorithms, but this same kind of runaway instability. And so this was really my first kind of project in grad school to how can we dampen down this error? And I wanna note that the neural network was actually you know, 200 times or so faster than the reference integrator, whereas the random forest was actually slower than the very expensive solver in GeoSchem. 
Um, so for all of these kinds of things, we pursued neural networks, which are kind of harder to work with, uh, more so than random forests, but we really want this speed up. And uh, before I get into sort of the results of my work, I just want to go over some kind of big idea concepts of why we want to use machine learning. So a really a tenant of data science is that high dimensional systems, that dimensionality is just really artificially high. There's always some kind of lower dimensional subspace that we can exploit. Uh, here is a very simple example of this 3D Swiss roll where it's a you know, data that exists when a three-dimensional space, it kind of twirls in space, but we can see that we can retain a lot of that information, condensing it down just into its 2D space. There's a lot of coherent structure within this data that uh, you know, we don't really need this third dimension. It's all still uh, explainable within this lower subspace. Same thing with chemistry. You know, chemistry is very high dimensional, but there's families, there's reaction rates that can all be sort of distilled down into more representative samples. Okay, and so why we should and shouldn't use machine learning for this kind of project uh, specific to chemical solvers. Why? The chemical calculation is very expensive. I hope I impressed upon you that much so far. You know, uh, we need to speed up these solvers. Two, the calculation is also highly repetitive and oftentimes very redundant. If you look at outputs of a chemical transport or air quality model, looking over the ocean from one grid to the next, it all basically looks the same. Having to invoke a full chemical solver over the ocean grid box is not necessary, not important for this case. It's very repetitive. And lastly, it's fully deterministic. So there's, it makes the learning problem a bit easier. There's no real stochasticity involved, at least for the offline kind of chemical transport models that I work with. Uh, why we shouldn't, it's very high dimensional. Uh, a lot of the good neural network machine learning papers I've seen, you know, it'll deal with inputs of around you know, 10 or so to predict one or two outputs, but with a chemical mechanism, we have hundreds of evolving species that are all coupled together. So it's very high dimensional. And really, it lacks any physics-based constraints that is kind of intrinsic to a lot of what we do as scientists. You know, neural networks will not natively conserve mass or conserve energy. Everything we have to do, we have to kind of bake into these models. So there's a lot of design choices we have to be very aware about. Um, and again, we have this large-scale error growth that we need to address. And so this first paper, um, we published this in 2020, tries to do three things. One, can we you know, dampen this error growth? Two, can we handle these high dimensional systems? Um, you know, instead of working with 200 species, is there some lower dimensional subspace? And three, we want this speed up. And so, in order to tackle this kind of problem, I designed this um, architecture I show here, which tries to do two big things. One is to compress the dimensionality of our chemical mechanisms. And two, I call this uh, capturing slower chemical modes during training. Because what I found out in my first paper before uh, starting grad school is that we're able to capture fast species very well, such as radical reactions. We can get those uh, right. Um, but over time, uh, you can get the fast reactions right, but even if you're a little bit off in the slower reactions, that can sort of change and move your neural network predictions outside of its training zone. And so to address these two things, we came up with this uh, workflow. Um, but first, the data set that I use is, again, a zero-dimensional box model. It's the CBMZ mosaic box model. It's a dimensionality of 101 species, so 77 gas phase and 24 aerosol. And we have four weather variables being temperature, pressure, relative humidity, and the angle of the sun. So on this side, how this works is that I have my 101 species at time step zero. Um, here it's concentration at time step zero. And I run it through an encoder and out a decoder. An encoder decoder, maybe some of you are familiar, compresses the dimensionality of your um, input species. 
So uh, sort of a classic example is like you take a picture on your phone, you text it to your friend, your phone encodes that image to a smaller kind of bit representation. Uh, your friend receives that kind of compressed image and there they have a decoder on their phone that then reconstructs it back into the high dimensional space. So we do that here, but with chemical species going from 101 species down into a fewer uh, number of uh, sort of compressed representation of features. Um, when we're in this little subspace, we then move it forward uh, through an, uh, what I call an operator. The operator just pushes the chemical system one time step into the future. So I go plus one time step. I have some kind of output then, which I then feed back into the operator again while ingesting new weather variables that account for, you know, uh, plus one uh, time step future uh, uh, given these changes in these weather variables. So what I do then is I do that 24 times to simulate a diurnal cycle. I have 24 outputs. I run it back through the decoder to then reconstruct that um, uh, back into the original 101 dimension subspace or original space. So what this does is I'm working in a lower dimensional subspace um, using the encoder decoder and only during training of this model that I have it predict a trajectory of information rather than a single time step. Um, so it's trying to predict forward in time, which then will hopefully capture these slower reactions and hopefully kind of granted greater stability. Um, I should mention that it's similar in ideas to an LSTM, a long um, short-term memory, if people are familiar, but it doesn't have this memory hyperparameter or memory variable that actually is quite expensive to keep. We still want these things to be quite fast. And the results we kind of get, I show here, where these are uh, results for ozone. Uh, the top row is this kind, kind of counterfactual example we set of just training over one single time step. So when you train a model over a single time step, run it forward, it basically explodes. Here, when I have this kind of diurnal training of the mechanism, that we're able to get much more uh, accurate results. And we don't have error that grows during this 24-hour cycle. And so, you know, within this 24-hour framework, we're able to have stable error. It actually goes almost to about a week before starting to fail. Um, but you can always extend that training to longer and longer time periods. Another thing we learned is that neural nets are very good at very specific tasks. So I'll um, touch on this concept a little later too. Uh, we find that a neural network that is used to predict all species in a mechanism is much less accurate than one that's specialized for a specific purpose. For example, here I'm predicting total PM or particulate matter, just the aerosol, and it really doesn't even have aerosol chemistry turned on. It just does something the first time step and then it kind of predicts a no change. But you can see that if um, we don't have a specialized network, it kind of just um, wiggles everywhere. Whereas if we have a PM specific neural network, it's much more stable. Um, and uh, the error is much less than one that's kind of generalized here. So Makoto, we have yeah. a quick question in yes. the chat. Um, Clara Orby is asking, can you explain how the encoder works, um, i.e. what informs the dimensionality reduction? Yes, so I'll get to that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm actually getting to that right here. Perfect. So, so I think this is a pretty cool idea and a pretty cool example here. On the x-axis is how compressed I make the mechanism. So uh, on the far right here, we have basically no compression. We have this 101 dimensional mechanism. And then as we go towards zero, we compress the subspace into fewer and fewer features, going all the way to only four variables that we compress it to. And on the y-axis, it's kind of the error of the, mecha, the solver's test set over a mil one million examples. So we see here that all the results that I showed you, I actually compressed 101 species down into 16 species without really, really any loss of accuracy. The performance on the test set is very similar. 
Um, once you go really towards zero, um, you're really limiting the expressibility of your network, right? Going from 101 species down into four, you're just going to have a lot of high error because it's just not expressive enough, not enough degrees of freedom. But what I found really interesting was that when we go down to 64 species, actually the error on the test set was lower than the original mechanism, meaning that having this kind of optimally reduced number of features was easier to integrate and more accurate than the original 101 degrees because you're um, reducing the sort of uh, redundancies in your species. You're grouping together species that are uh, similar in terms of families, similar in terms of reaction rates, etc. In the paper here, it's in the SI, I look through each of these species and they're actually kind of grouped by uh, families. Uh, hopefully that answered it. Um, it's this here is basically a a linear reduction, so it's not uh, like a lossy compression. We found that that was better than um, using some kind of activation function in the encoder decoder. But yeah, so the idea here is pretty cool that we can condense mechanisms into a lower representation that is actually easier to integrate than the original mechanism. Okay, and last um, sort of result for this paper was the timing aspect of this. So this is what we really wanted to see. Uh, we see here it's the time it takes um, to integrate the chemistry for 1 million grid cells using the CBMZ mosaic box model, which is written in Fortran, uh, running on a single CPU. It takes around five hours to integrate 1 million grid cells. If I run the same kind of number of grid cells and predictions on this neural network system, it takes around one minute. So it's around the 260 times the speed up that we're seeing from that original paper I showed. And if we were to give the neural network model additional resources, such as more CPUs or even a GPU, we can go from you know five hours to, down to almost nine seconds with a GPU. So these are the kind of um, result, timing results we want to see, but we also want to get this really high accuracy. Okay, and so, this next part is really the uh, title of my talk in this kind of more recent paper, is how can we use all of these ideas that we've developed with our box models and scale them to these complicated three-dimensional global chemistry models. And so we know that box models are really great for refining our machine learning methods, but there's no guarantee that they'll scale and perform as well in uh, these complicated parent models. And so in order to not you know, make my life too hard and work with the GIOS chem mechanism, which has 250 plus species, that I instead use the super fast chemical mechanism. And when, by its name, it's uh, very super fast. This is because it's very low dimensional. There's only 12 species. And it's supposed to be generally representative of tropospheric ozone at a synoptic scale. So the first two rows here is just comparing the implemented super fast mechanism compared to the standard GIOS chem mechanism. And you can see that, you know, there it basically passes the eye test. It's not uh, exactly like GIOS chem, but it's fairly representative of what uh, ozone looks like. You know, it's higher in urban polluted grid cells, lower in the remote atmosphere, for example. But this is kind of a nice toy sandbox mechanism to work with our machine learning methods. Um, I should note here that NOx is very different between the two, where we have a, a ton of NOx in the super fast because there's really no loss pathways. It's very simple. There's no nighttime chemistry, no N205 hydrolysis. So it's very simplistic, but you know, it's good enough for what we want to work with. And so I Benchmark this in GeoScan version 12. Um, this was near the start of my PhD because we're on version 14 or so right now, so it's been a while. But um, here I'm at uh, the coarsest resolution we have in the model. And we have one hour chemical time steps. And each chemical time step, I track 20 variables, being two physical variables, temperature and column density. Uh, six photolysis frequencies, so this is um, the how the sun changes reaction rates and uh, the concentration of the 12 gas phase species in the mechanism. 
And as you can tell for just a one month data set, we're not data poor at all. We can get nearly 62 million samples. So we have a lot of data to work with. And I train the model, all these kinds of training I do in 2016 and then test it on the following year in 2017 as a sort of re uh, removing the effects of any autocorrelation. Okay, and so a huge burden of this. Oh, yes, so you, you train online in the 3D model? I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so a huge burden of this problem is having our very complicated, well established chemical transform models, climate models work with all these kinds of machine learning libraries that are largely written in Python or, you know, not Fortran. You know, I tried experimenting with neural Fortran. It was pretty hard to use. I didn't like using it. Um, there's something called the Keras uh, or Fortran Keras bridge when I was starting, which kind of connects the two, but the functionality was very limited. And so I really wanted the flexibility of using all of these uh, Python machine learning libraries. So what we did is built this C intermediate bridge that kind of connects the two languages so they, they can talk to each other. This took a huge amount of work and a lot of this is uh, help from one of the co-authors, Hype Englund, in the group. But once I have that done, then I'll show you what this uh, machine learning solver looks like in the ecosystem of GeoSchem, where um, basically I rip out the guts of the chemistry module in GeoSchem and replace it with a very similar looking figure that I showed from my 2020 paper, um, where I take the same exact variables that the chemical solver in GeoSchem takes and then I pass along the same, you know, the change in the concentration of the same species into the next um, module, which is deposition here. And uh, like the question in the back, what I learned is that there are different ways to train these machine learning solvers being offline and online. And I'll kind of, um, you know, be a little more didactic about this, just so everyone knows what I mean when I say offline versus online. So if you read a machine learning kind of science paper, 99% of them will be about offline or batch learned training. How this works is you generate a ton of data, right? This is a, the big data, data-driven modeling um, systems. You generate that data, kind of manicure it, um, uh, clean it up for whatever kind of scientific problem you want to solve. And then you divide it up into random independent samples or called batches. You then train your model on these batches. Um, and you go, you cycle through the data multiple times, right? One epoch is one uh, full iteration through all of your data, and you can do multiple epochs. So the pros of this, it's very simple to code. You can, you know, type how to train neural network and look at the first link on Google and you'll get pretty far. Uh, it's fast, relatively easy to train, um, you know, it can be pretty expensive, but there's a lot of infrastructure for all uh, for this right now. And you can also manipulate data. So what I showed you with that recursive training idea that I showed you in my first paper where I predict a diurnal cycle, I'm also kind of predicting into the future. So you have this future data and you can do a bunch of different kinds of manipulations. The cons is that um, you risk overfitting. Basically all machine learning models will overfit. It's, you can try to regularize and prevent this, but you're cycling through the same data multiple times. So there's a really high risk of this. Um, you have to generate and store massive data archives. So, you know, when I did this, even for three months of data in GeoSchem, it took around one terabyte. So it's a lot of data. Um, and there's also this risk of under or over sampling different chemical environments. So I might have a single batch that's all ocean grid cell where, you know, I really want to get the polluted chemistry, right? That's the complicated areas to get right. Um, so there's this risk of uh, having unequally distributed samples. Online learning is a bit different. Uh, you can call it sequential learning, but how this works is you train the machine learning model as you get the data. And so what I did in my work is that as GeoSchem itself ran, I was training the machine learning solver in tandem with it. So what this means is that GeoSchem, you know, this one time step generates a bunch of data, then it hands it off to the machine learning solver. It starts training, learning that, and then that data gets thrown away, go to the next time step, et cetera. 
the pros of this is, you know, I say cannot overfit, you could still overfit, but the idea is that you only see each data point once. So you're not gonna necessarily largely overfit. You have representative realizations. I ingest the entire three-dimensional grid of Geoscam at each time step. So I'm getting, you know, an equal in the amount of the polluted or the upper tropospheric grids that I might otherwise be sort of hidden away. And also, I don't have to uh, store the data at all. It's um, use it when it's generated, and when it's gone, I don't need it. The cons is very hard to implement. You know, I have to develop this whole in infrastructure to connect two languages. It's very difficult. Uh, the training is also very expensive because we know that these uh, models that we want to speed up are slow. So in a way, it's doubly expensive to run this kind of infrastructure. Uh, limited observation windows, so you can't see into the future or into the past because that data does not exist beyond your own little window you have. And there's also this idea of catastrophic forgetting, which basically if you keep retraining a machine learning model, it might forget what it uh, learned in the past. Um, we, we found that this wasn't a really big problem. You just kind of have a very low learning rate and that helps solve it. Okay, and so, can I, can I ask? So yes. you have a you have a single yeah. or whatever. And then that single thing is being trained at each grid point at each time step. It's taking all the grids, but um so it's like a general solver for all grids, but it is at each time step, yeah. Okay. And so uh, I wanted to see, okay, how do these different ways of training uh, affect sort of accuracy and results? So I'm gonna show you different ways of uh, training this machine learning solver and comparing it at surface level over the globe, um, looking at ozone concentrations here. So we look at absolute error, fractional error, and then a time series of RMSE. I do all my training in June, July, August of 2016, and then I test it on July of the following year, and these are the test set results. So I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Yeah. Uh, so the, the critical part is this like learning rate, right? Because if the learning rate was like really fast, then it would just be basically doing like an offline between each time step, an offline learning between yes. each time step. And just be using the entire batch of that 3D data to yeah. learn. So itself. yeah, so if the learning rate is really strong, then it's just gonna immediately forget what happened in the previous time step. If it's uh, really low, it's not gonna learn anything. So it has to be somewhere low but you know higher than not learning anything so i'll show you what that looks like here so this uh is our kind of counterfactual example that i've been showing you where you just train over a single time step right t to t plus one only training over one time step in the in an offline data set we i implement this in geoscan we see that it immediately had super super high error it really didn't learn anything it kind of predicts the same value everywhere over the globe this is actually a very common way of, if you just naively train a model, this is a common result. It's just gonna predict the mean of your data set. Here, I offline train using that kind of recursive idea that I showed you earlier, where I'm making you predict the diurnal cycle into the future. And we see that we reduce error by quite a bit, over 10 ppb, and we have some kind of land ocean bias that we're seeing in the error metrics. But just sort of to situate you for errors in ozone chemistry, really 10 ppb is our really big upper bound of acceptable error. So 20 ppb is still way too huge. And so what then I did was I took this model that learned something, right? It's not random, it doesn't predict a single value, it learns some kind of dynamics. I put it into Geoschem and retrained it online. And what that happens, uh, what we see then is it goes all the way down to 6 ppb. So I retrain it in June, July, August of the previous year, and then I test it in the next year, and this error goes down all the way to 6 ppb. And we have some kind of hemispheric bias where, you know, it's kind of lower in the southern hemisphere and higher in the north uh, compared to the reference Geoschem solver. But then I thought, you know, this is really inefficient. I'm training, basically double training, right? I'm training offline, training back online. What happens if I just train everything online to begin with from scratch? And then that gives us the lowest error by far, all the way down to one PPB. And there's no real big spatial kind of gradient or error that we see here. So we attribute why this retrained model 
doesn't do as well just one train from scratch is that some things are really hard to unlearn with a neural net. You know, the weights are pretty set in the model and it's kind of hard to overcome what it's kind of learned already that's kind of well ingrained. And you're simulating over an entire month there. So yes, yeah, so this is the time series for the month going from the beginning of July to the end. Sorry, it's a little... So you're, so you're not seeing that error growth problem anymore. Exactly. Because of the... on Well, I thought you were saying earlier that you could get it to go for about a week before the error would start to grow. In the in the box model, yeah. In the box model. So I'll show you what this looks like over a long term, but... Yeah, it was interesting that even for this um, top row, we didn't see like an explosive error growth, but it was just kind of like high, stable, very bad error to begin with. So... Yeah, but we're not seeing error growth at all in these. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this one. It's a bit complicated, but there's a lot of kind of jam-packed information here that I think is really cool. So, again, I reiterate that neural networks are really great for very narrow tasks. So I found that a machine learning solver trained for a single species, again, is much better than one that's trained for all species. And one that is trained for a single season is much more accurate and less biased than one that's trained for the entire year. And so here I'm showing you um, on the y-axis this normalized mean bias error percent. So just kind of our error metric that we're looking at. This is in relation to the reference geoschem solver. And on the x-axis is time over the entire year. And each of these kind of wiggles is one day out of the 365 in this year. And so the top left corner of each plot shows the annual average um, error for the average over the entire year. And we see that a lot of these are you know, less than 10% error for the entire year for this species. Um, the big caveat is this last plot here. So HNO3, or nitric acid, is kind of a dummy species in this mechanism. There's no for, uh, sort of chemical loss to it. Uh, there's no first order correction we can do to it. So it kind of just accumulates error, but it also doesn't really influence any of the other species. I shouldn't, probably shouldn't have you included it to begin with in the mechanism, but too late now. <laughs> Um, CHC5H8, or isoprene, uh, we see pretty large errors here, but isoprene is largely emitted from uh, very high biogenic producing regions, such as the Congo in Africa, the Amazon rainforest in the southeast United States. We get the hot spots actually correct. A lot of this error is kind of over the ocean or very kind of remote grid cells that just have a little bit of absolute error, but it kind of drives this fractional error. So we're okay with it. We're just trying to, you know, describe why we're seeing these high values here. But so how I read this, we see a couple different dynamics at play. So let's look at NOx here in red. So I just drew NO and NO2 just for this plot. We see that in January, February, we have some kind of negative learned bias in relation to the solver, uh, the reference solver. I simulate forward, January, February, then I switch solvers to a March, April, May seasonal solver. And then we have some kind of positive bias compared to Geoschem. So, you know, then I simulate through March, April, May, but then when I switch to June, July, August, we have this huge negative error perturbation down to almost, you know, 30% error. But we see that over the course of this season, we start going back up to this zero baseline. And, you know, we see this kind of behavior in multiple species. If we look at CO here, we have some kind of rising error in June, July, August, and then a dampening down in the following season. And we kind of hypothesize that, in a way, these solvers have learned the relationships uh, similar to Le Chatelier's, in which error that has been built up in a previous season due to a different set of solvers, the next set is trying to dampen it back down. It's kind of weirdly learned this kind of error correction that is kind of intrinsic in chemical solvers because we built it in, but it kind of uh, shows this dynamic at play. So um, again, we also see that error does not sort of explode within this uh, year long time frame, And this is one of the first kind of uh, machine learned implemented into a chemical transport model or a complicated model where we don't see kind of this explosion over a long-term time scale. And I guess it's long-term for applications in our group, in our field, you know, if it's, you know, CESM and they care about decades, maybe this doesn't work, but for 
atmospheric chemistry, this is sort of a, a good benchmark for us. And we also get a five times speed up. So, you know, we're not seeing that orders of magnitude speed up that we did with the box model. We're also working with a very small dimensional mechanism. If we had much larger dimensions, um, the speed up would be more obvious. But because it's so small, um, you know, it isn't as dramatic, although five times is quite large still. And um, are these the um, biases for just the surface concentrations? Um, or is this like, you know, throughout the atmosphere? This is throughout the atmosphere, yeah. When you train it for each season, do you look, I mean, can you look at the individual coefficients? Like, are there night and day differences? Or why would you do like chunks instead of like running average training? Hmm. Or why, or how? Like, is there night and day difference? Like, is there any physical meaning to how it's, it, it switches so profoundly from season to season? Can yeah, you so, the coefficients? Does it mean anything? Yeah, I didn't look too much at the coefficients because they're hard to interpret. But what we've seen is that if I train, you know, for ozone, for example, over the year-long course, um, I see that I can get summer right. You know, the high of ozone in Northern Hemisphere summer, I get that right. But then everything else is just kind of crappy. We're, what we're seeing is that we can get sort of the maximum values of the distribution right of whatever season. So like NOx in North America during December, we can get right. But then NOx during spring, we just don't get right. It's, you know, it's kind of like it gets biased to the absolute high value of your seasonal time series, if that makes sense. We can also talk more about it uh, after the talk too. Happy to delve more into that. Sorry if I didn't uh, answer it correctly, but let me just uh, keep going before uh, run out of time here, where here I'm just showing you a time series. This is for July of the test set, looking at the uh, reference GS Chem Solver in black compared to the machine learning solver in blue. Here I'm looking at Beijing, a polluted kind of urban grid cell versus uh, Cape Verde, kind of a remote grid cell. Um, you, we can see that we can get the kind of diurnal uh, patterns right of Beijing and Cape Verde, which doesn't really have the human driven emissions. Uh, we can get to kind of the synoptic uh, scale variability of ozone correct too. Um, we also see this for the entire time series, yeah. So this is the same neural network for both? Yes, it, yeah, exactly. It's a sort of a gen one neural, uh, it's for the summer, so June, July, August, but yeah, it's the same one predicting all these different grid cells. Okay, and so, you know, all of this kind of is interesting and exciting, but there's really one kind of big limitation that I'm running into now that's kind of limiting us. So, we find that we have very large errors in remote areas. So here I'm showing you the cross section, uh, looking at ozone for two different seasons, uh, December, January, February, June, July, August, comparing the GeoSchem reference to what the machine learning solver shows. For ozone, you know, it passes the eye test pretty well. Um, we get absolute errors that are less than that 10 ppb cutoff that I showed you, and fractional errors can be higher, but they're higher in kind of the lower concentration regions. So we might be, you know, a couple ppb different in sort of the southern hemisphere higher up in the altitude. But, you know, this is okay error uh, for us. The problem is that same kind of relationship also here with NOx. So NOx, as you can see, we get the uh, hot spots pretty well, right? These are uh, north or uh, higher latitude, you know, Europe, United States, we get those hot spots of NOx right. But we have very large error in remote regions, um, especially in the upper troposphere and kind of in, um, you know, over the Antarctic. And so this is where the problem is, is that just being a little bit off in NOx concentrations has a huge effect on the chemical system. It can completely change the regime of ozone and all the other kind of uh, species within your area. And so what I'm basically finding is that neural nets can kind of recreate the bulk of the statistical distribution of your concentrations right. So we can get high NOx, we can get uh, high ozone events, we can get kind of mean ozone, 
but at this very low kind of concentration regime, it's kind of noisy, right? It when you train a machine learning solver, it's not um, getting very accurate results because this does not affect the cost function as much as the sort of higher concentration areas. And right now, you know, that's um, sort of been a limitation is trying to get that to work within the context of what we're doing here. Can I ask you something? Yeah. I mean, maybe you'll cover it later, but what you're saying, you know, the cost function and the high value uh, values affecting more than the low value uh, values. Yeah. Uh, but then there are also more other things that might matter, like you say you are working with a condensed chemical mechanism to start with, so maybe this is representing better higher pollution areas rather than clean conditions, just because of limitations of the actual chemical mechanisms we start with. Hmm. Or it might be that uh, you know the you move into this different chemical regime, and I'm thinking of you know the ozone isoplasts, for example, that you just go to some place that the optimization needs to be different and mm. you're not training it for that yeah yeah no i definitely agree it's just there's a point at which you're limiting your the elegance of your problem right so having a chemical solver for each grid cell or for different regimes would definitely be more accurate than this generalized approach we're taking but we're really trying to come up with that general approach like um there's been other groups where it's a much more technical of an engineering problem where they use machine learning to replace like one piece of the implicit solver, right? So it's just kind of making a, a slow part of the very technical solver speed up. You know, that's not really interesting to me scientifically, but definitely specializing the problem more will get us uh, better results. And, you know, um, my time's almost up here, but I just want to say sort of what I believe, you know, uh, machine learning may be good for in the context of chemical transport, air quality, earth system models. I think there's a lot of good and interesting things right now. Uh, namely, um, this idea of compression, I think, is very interesting. It's still hard to understand what to do with it because you can compress mechanisms and they become easier to integrate. Uh, but you also need to train that chemical solver on that representation. And that still is not the most stable. Um, because you know you can't you can group them into a lower dimensional representation, but you still need to integrate them, and so that's kind of complicated. Uh, Oben Sturm, who's at USC right now, um, kind of took the ideas from this paper that I had and compressed species and then transported them and then decompressed them, and so the, he sped up the um, advection kind of convection operators. And so, you know, that I think is an interesting uh, avenue for this. Uh, I think machine learning is really great for anomaly detection. Here's a paper um, looking more at, you know, elements of COVID, which are kind of kind of obvious when you shut down emissions. But I think machine learning can uh, kind of more subtly find when things start to diverge from sort of a natural frequency of uh, pollution dynamics that we're used to. Um, also, uh, in terms of anomaly detection, you can use machine learning to figure out when things start to fail with other machine learning solvers, right? So you can train another sol um, algorithm that predicts when your machine learning solver starts to fail or drift too far. So I think that's an interesting approach. Um, in terms of parameterizations, I think the climate field has been doing a ton of machine learning corrections, you know, whether it's coarse graining or improving some kind of turbulent parameterizations. I think they're kind of ahead of atmospheric chemistry, but I know that um, you know people are working on improving dry depth parameterizations and things like that. Um, and I think right now the best is data set curation. So you know I think data fusion using machine learning to combine a bunch of different covariates and satellite and observational data, cram it and create a really nice gridded data product, I think. This is like a super useful, uh, really uh, good product right now. And so some things I think are not so promising. I say chemical solvers here, so you know, kind of half, in, half joking, but uh, it's, it's really hard. I think um, just like your question, it's really hard to get an elegant, interesting solution without creating a, a ton of chemical solvers. You know, I, because I already had to create one solver for each species and then uh, for each species, four solvers for the different seasons. So I'm starting to get to, to a lot of solvers. Um, 
you know, phys we find that physics-based constraints and many times actually don't help. Um, uh, another kind of paper result from Oben Sturm found that he incorporated mass conservation into these neural nets and found that that didn't help stability at all, that the neural network still exploded and then you had a negative exploding correction in the other direction. So there's no guarantee of this stability that way. And you know, I think I've talked to a lot of kind of computer scientists, a lot of applied mathematicians, and they find that the way we eval are evaluating this problem is not the right way to do it so, in that we're creating these statistical models, right? Machine learning is basically a statistical learner. And we're evaluating it as if it's this physics, uh, sort of physics-based equations-driven model that requires incredibly high degrees of accuracy, right? This fourth order, Rosenbrock implicit solver. Um, it's hard to get that same kind of behavior with a statistics model that kind of just tries to capture the bulk of your behavior. Um, and I also think right now I've explored a lot with data assimilation in terms of machine learning. I think it's a very kind of new field, but in a lot of ways I think, especially in sort of the NASA institutes that Really, there's a lot of data assimilation architectures that are super efficient right now, and trying trying to cram machine learning into it is kind of redundant, and it's actually way less studied. So right now, I don't know if anyone can point me to any interesting machine learning data assimilation kind of things that'd be interesting, but right now I'm still thinking that that is kind of far off. But you know, but uh, very happy to connect with everyone here. Um, here's some basic takeaways that I have. Um, so uh, as Olivia mentioned, I'm also um, working more with fires now too, and we have a press release coming out tomorrow on a paper on prescribed fires, and being in New York City, I think a lot of you might be interested in sort of new research with uh, on that front too, uh, given recent events. But, you know, um, very happy to talk more about these uh, machine learning chemical solver kinds of studies. This is sort of my first big um, you know, my first uh, love of research moment with these, this kind of project, so very happy to always continue it. But uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, okay, we have five minutes, so we'll take any questions from in the room as well as online. I see hands clapping online for you. <laughs> um, uh, okay, it looks like Pierre has a question. Um, I'll unmute you. No, that didn't unmute you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, can you? Yeah, great talk. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I thought that was really interesting. I just wanted to get back to you, your comments because I thought they were a little bit counterintuitive to some extent. So you mentioned, uh, and you had that result about the online learning being better than offline and then online. And I find that a bit surprising to some extent, right? Because you could still tune or change the learning rate so that you would still kind of converge to the full online, you know, if you were to use a very low learning rate for the offline. So that was my first question. And then kind of a really good question. You said that um, the neural nets are really good at being specific, but not really at being more generic. But I kind of believe that's not true most of the time because, you know, I mean, we use, for instance, uh, you know, chat GPT and stuff. I mean, they are really good at defining tasks that are very generic. So. So I wonder if some of that's actually not really to kind of the loss or what is the target to some extent, or maybe the dimension of your architecture. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm trying to remember the first question. Um, Which one? Offline? Oh yes, uh, so for the offline, online, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I could have definitely done more tuning of the offline and get this kind of nice pipeline between the two. Uh, a lot, in fact, the online kind of idea was inspired by Stefan Rasp's paper, um, you know, where he trained it, retrained it off uh, from offline to online and then saw that better um, performance. Um, it's just, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't exp um, explored too much with it, with this. I think, um, I think your comment is super valid and probably true. I just haven't uh, had enough time to kind of tinker going from one to the another. It just found, you know, just in terms of easiness, going straight from scratch from online learning just seemed much more stable. But yeah, definitely if I had a better a priori trained model, I think it could also be, you know, equally as good too. Um, 
in terms of your second question, you know, I'd be happy to talk more and learn more about this. It's just everything that, I, that I've done, I found that the more specific neural nets are just better at the problems. I don't know if it's the chemical system compared to a lot of more climate driven kind of fields, but I'm just seeing that there's, you know, the chemistry system is just so multi-scale that it's really hard to get polluted Beijing grid cell correct while also getting remote Antarctic in the upper troposphere. So it's sort of orders of magnitude um, difference in kind of the range of the species that we see too. So yeah, if you uh, can refer me to some more generalized models and ideas, that'd be great to learn too. But just from what I've done so far, and that um, that's what I've been seeing. Thanks. So you mentioned using machine learning to identify when you're you jump the ship. Sure. <laughs> so how? Well, why haven't? Is that your next step? Will you do that? Uh. Yeah, well, I'm doing more climate stuff in my next kind of stop, but, you know, um, I think that would be interesting. It's just right now I ha don't have that on my radar because this is still not accurate enough to, you know, implement a full kind of deployment scale, right? Just we're not getting the upper troposphere right. It's, it doesn't, uh, I think that needs to be improved before going to that next step. But that's definitely, if any, it's in anyone's wheelhouse, that should be a, a fun thing to do. Cool. Um, okay. Well, thank you again, Makoto. This was awesome. And um, thank you everyone for, for joining online. Um, I guess I will stop the video. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, John usually does the recording, so I'm trying to remember. Okay. Don't close your WebEx window. Stop recording and